again, welcome to Tosser and Della. Um, today's topic is monolith to microservices. Our speaker for today is Sharma. Sharma is a VP of software engineering at GitHub, where she is responsible for core platform and ecosystem. Prior to GitHub, Shah was the VP of engineering at SendGrid and was part of the leadership team that took the company public in 2017. Awesome. Shah cares passionately about diversity, yes, equity and inclusion in the workplace. And in 2018, she was named the winner of the Denver Business Journal's Outstanding Women in Business, in Technology and Telecommunications. Shah lives in Boulder, Colorado with her husband and two awesome children. And she enjoys skiing, sailing, and traveling with her family. And on this note, we say welcome, Sha, and you have the floor. Hi, thank you. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Ani said, my name is Shaw, and uh, let's get started. Can everyone see my screen okay with the presentation? Yes. <clears throat> All right, awesome. All right, so GitHub actually started in 2008. Uh, as way of making it easier for developers to host and share their code. <clears throat> the founders at GitHub were open source contributors and influencers in the Ruby community. So because of that, GitHub's architecture is a little bit unique. It's very deeply rooted in Ruby on Rails. And over the course of the company's history, we have employed some of the world's best Ruby developers to help us scale and optimize our code base. Um, and hopefully this sets some context for how we got to where we got to today um, with our monolith. So now over the course of the next decade, we've grown to over 50 million developers on our platform, over 80 million pull requests merged per year, and over 100 million repos across every continent of the world. As you can see, a monolithic architecture got us pretty far. Um, it's a code base that's over 12 years old. Uh, we have coordinated deploy trains that handles multiple deployments per day, and a highly scaled platform serving over a billion API calls on a daily basis. Um, and I would say the front end is fairly performant user interface that focuses on just getting the job done. Um, internally at GitHub, we also went through a significant growth phase in the last 18 months. Uh, now with over 2000 employees, we have more than doubled the number of engineers contributing to our code base. Uh, we've grown both organically and through acquisitions such as Semmel, <clears throat> NPM, Dependabot and Poolpanda. Additionally, GitHub is a highly distributed team, just like Indela. We have <clears throat> over 70% of our employees working outside of our San Francisco headquarters, and this was prior to the pandemic. GitHub employees and contractors collaborate across six continents working in all time zones. So with over now a thousand internal developers bring a diverse set of skills from all these different acquisitions operating in a wide range of technologies, it's become clear to us that we need to fundamentally rethink how we do software development at GitHub. Having everyone learn Ruby on Rails before they can be productive and having everyone doing development in the same monolithic code base is no longer the most efficient and optimal way to scale GitHub. So there's this thing called Conway's Law. According to Conway's Law, which states, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. This actually also applies in reverse. So <clears throat> having a monolithic environment will lead to bigger stakeholder meetings and more complicated decision-making process because of all the interwoven logic and shared data that impacts all the teams. So this is what got us thinking, right? Is it finally to start migrating out of our monolithic Ruby on Rails architecture towards a more microservices architecture? And if so, how should we go about doing it? So both monolithic and microservices architectures actually have their advantages. In a monolith environment, it's easier to get up and running faster without having to worry about complex dependencies and pulling in all the right pieces, a new GitHubber can get GitHub up and running on their local machines within hours. Um, there's some code level simplicities in a monolith as well. For example, you don't have to add extra logic to deal with timeouts or worry about failing gracefully due to network latency and outages. Additionally, because everyone is working in a shared tech stack and has familiarity with the same code base, it's much easier to move people and teams around to work on different features within the monolith and push towards more of a global prioritization of features. But because of the way GitHub has grown in the last 18 months, some of the advantages of a microservices environment are starting to look really appealing to us. For example, setting up feature teams with system level ownership and having functional boundaries through clearly defined API contracts. Um, the teams have a lot of freedom to choose the tech stack that make the most sense for them, 
a lot, as long as the API contracts are followed. Smaller services also mean easier to read code, quicker ramp up time, and easier troubleshooting within that code base. So a developer no longer has to understand all the inner workings of a large monolithic code base in order to be productive. Um, and most importantly, services can now be scaled separately based on their individual needs. So with this context in mind, let's go through six practical recommendations for making this transition from a monolith to microservices as smooth as possible. Um, in the next sections, the next four sections will focus on laying the groundwork prior to the migration. And then the last two sections will cover coding best practices in a distributed systems environment. So the first recommendation is about being practical and being pragmatic. Um, before we jumped into this transition at GitHub, we spent some time thinking about the why behind our decision and our goal for making this change. It's a huge shift for us from a cultural perspective and requires a lot of work. So we needed to be intentional and think about what problems we're trying to solve and what pain points we're trying to solve. At GitHub, we're doing this so we can enable over half of our developer base who joined in the last 18 months to be productive outside of the monolith. The goal for us is enablement and not replacement. Um, and because of that, we need to accept the fact that GitHub for the foreseeable future will be a hybrid monolith microservices environment, which means it's still very important for us to maintain and improve our existing code base inside of the monolith. A good example of this is our recent upgrade to Ruby 2.7. You can read more about what we did and how we made our overall systems faster and better on the GitHub blog. I'll have a reference link to that at the end of the talk. Good architecture starts with modularity. The first step towards breaking up a monolith is to think about the separation of code and data based on features and functionalities. This can be done within the monolith before physically actually separating them in a microservices environment. And it's generally a good architecture practice to make the code base more manageable. Start with the data and pay close attention to how they're being accessed. Make sure each service owns and controls its own data and that data access only happens through clearly defined API contracts. I've seen a lot of cases where people start off by pulling out the code logic from the monolith, but still very much rely on calls into shared data stores and databases inside the monolith. This often leads to a distributed monolith scenario where it ends up being the worst of both worlds, having to manage all the complexities of microservices without any of the benefits. Benefits such as being able to quickly and independently deploy a subset of features into production. Getting data separation right is the cornerstone of migrating from a monolith to microservices architecture. So let's take a closer look at how we approach this at GitHub. First, we identified the functional boundaries within existing database schemas and grouped the actual database tables along these boundaries. For example, we grouped everything related to repositories together, everything related to users together, and everything related to projects together. These resulting functional groups are referred to as schema domains and are captured in a YAML definitions file. This is now our source of truth. And it is expected to be updated whenever tables are added or removed from our database schemas. We used a linter test to help remind developers to keep this file up to date as they make those changes. Next, we identified a partition key for each schema domain. This is a shared field that links all the information together for a functional group. For example, the repository schema domain, which holds all the data related to repos, such as issues, pull requests, or re review comments, use repo ID as the partition key. Creating functional groups of database schemas will eventually help us safely split the data into different servers and clusters needed for a microservices architecture. But first, we needed to fix the current queries that go across these functional boundaries so that we don't break the product when the data separation actually happens. At GitHub, we implemented a query watcher in the monolith to help detect and alert us anytime a query crosses functional domains. We would then break up and rewrite these queries into multiple queries that respect the boundaries of the domains and perform any necessary joins at the application layer. Finally, after all the functional groups have been isolated, we can begin a similar process to further shard our data into tenant groups. With over 50 million users and 100 million repos, 
functional groups can grow pretty big at GitHub scale. This is where the partition keys we talked about earlier come in handy. We can follow a similar process to identify ranges of partition keys to group together. For example, the easy way to simply assign is to simply assign different users to different databases based on numeric ranges of the user IDs. But there's probably more logical groupings based on the characteristic of your data, such as regions and size. Tenantizing is a great way to limit the blast radius of any data storage failure to only a subset of your customers versus impacting everyone all at once. All right, we have spent quite a bit of time talking about the importance of data separation. Now let's switch gears and talk about how to lay the groundwork for actually extracting services out of the monolith. It's important to keep in mind that the dependency direction should always go from inside of the monolith to outside of the monolith and not the other way around. So we don't end up in that distributed monolith scenario that we talked about earlier. This means when extracting services out of the monolith, start with the core services and work your way out to the feature level. Next, look for gravitational pools that keep developers working in the monolith. It's common for shared tooling to be built up over time that makes development super simple inside the monolith. For example, Feature flags at GitHub provide monolith developers peace of mind for having control over who sees a new feature as it goes from staff shipped to beta to production. So make these shared resources available to developers outside of the monolith as well and start shifting that gravitational pull from inside of the monolith to outside of the monolith. Finally, make sure to remove old code path once the new services are up and running. Use the tool to understand who's calling the service and have a plan to move 100% of the traffic over to the new service so you don't get stuck supporting two sets of code forever. At GitHub, we use an open source tool called Scientist to help us with this type of rollout, where we can run and compare both the old code path and the new code path side by side. The core services that we decided to extract first at GitHub are authentication and authorization. Authentication is pretty complex because everything needs it and there's a ton of shared logic between the website and Git operations. This means that if github.com goes down, then access to Git systems is also down and Git operations such as pull and push will no longer work even through a command line interface. This is why it's so important for some of these fundamental pieces to be extracted to allow primary functions to still happen without having to be tied to the monolith. Authorization for us was much more straightforward and has already been rewritten as a Go service outside of the monolith. The current Rails app, AKA our monolith, communicates to it using TORP, which is a gRPC-like service-to-service -service communications framework, thus meeting the requirement for inside to outside dependency direction. Next, monitoring, CICD, and containerization are not new concepts but making the necessary operational changes to support the transformation from the monolith to microservices can yield significant time savings and help expedite the transition towards microservices. Keep the main characteristics of microservices in mind when you make these workflow changes. Operationally supporting numerous, small, independently running services with diverse tech stacks is very different from running a single highly customized pipeline for a large monolith. Remember to update monitoring from functional call metrics to network metrics and contract interfaces. Push towards a more automated and reliable CI CD pipeline that can be shared across services and use containerization to support a variety of languages and tech stacks and create workflow templates to enable reusability. For example, at GitHub, we created a self-service runtime platform to deliver microservices in a box. The goal is to drastically reduce each team's operational overhead for creating microservices. It comes with Kubernetes ready templates, free ingress setup for load balancing, automatic piping of logs into Splunk and integration into our internal deployment process, thus making it easier for any team that wants to experiment or set up a new microservice to get started. So far, we've covered a lot of ground on structural changes and shared foundations that are needed for a successful transition from a monolith to a microservices architecture.
From this point on, <clears throat> any new feature should be treated, should be created as a microservice outside of the monolith. Next, look for a few simple minor features to move out of the monolith. <clears throat> for example, features that don't have a lot of complicated dependencies and shared logic. Um, and this will give you some practice in terms of actually creating microservices outside of the monolith, um, which will then help you find common patterns and identify gaps before moving other larger, bigger and hairier functionalities outside of the monolith. Use product and business values to help determine the right size of microservices. Look for code and data that are often changed and deployed together to determine features or functionalities that are more tightly coupled. And use these as your natural groupings for what can be iterated on and deployed independently from other areas. Focusing on product and business value also helps with the organizational alignment across engineering, product, and design. Keep in mind, breaking things up too small, too early, can often add unnecessary complexities and overhead. For example, you have to maintain separate deploy queues, more on-call responsibilities for everyone, and single points of failure due to the lack of shared knowledge. Going from monolith to microservices is a major paradigm shift. Both the software development process and the actual code base will look significantly different going through this transition. So to wrap up this talk, we'll quickly cover service to service communications and designing for failure, both of which are important concepts in distributed systems and microservices development. There are two ways that services communicate with one another, synchronously and asynchronously. With synchronous communications, the client sends a request and waits for a response from the server. With asynchronous communications, the client sends a message without waiting for a response. And each message can be processed by multiple receivers. As mentioned earlier, we use TORP at GitHub to enable synchronous communications between monolith and core services outside of the monolith like authorization. As more and more services move outside of the monolith, however, synchronous communications starts to become wildly inefficient. So as the picture in that upper right demonstrates, it creates tight coupling between all the services, which ends up defeating the purpose of moving to a microservices architecture. A better approach is to create a shared events pipeline that can then broker messages across multiple producers and consumers. Um, as the Kafka example showed uh, down below. And this is the architecture that we actually use at SendGrid. Because services are no longer hosted on a single server, it's important to account for latency and fa failure scenarios when communicating over the network. A simple retry logic with clearly defined frequency of retries and a max retry count may be sufficient to handle most temporary network problems. But consider adding some intelligence to the retry logic using exponential backoff. So that means instead of retrying a request at a constant interval, exponential backoff will increase the amount of wait time between retries exponentially and provide some relief to servers that are not responding because of overloads. A circuit breaker can also be added as a medium between services both as a self-protection mechanism as an, and as a healing mechanism. For example, after a number of failed attempts, the circuit breaker will open and not allow any additional requests to come through until the service has recovered. Also think about setting a timeout so your service doesn't end up waiting forever for an external service to respond. Try failing gracefully by presenting a user-friendly message or falling back to the last known good state in the cache. Be mindful of the user experience and do what makes sense for the business. With that, let's quickly recap some of our key takeaways from the talk today. As we mentioned earlier, the first four sections focus on the foundational pieces that should be in place before you start down the journey of transitioning from monolith to microservices. Focus on the why. Think about modularity and data separation. Start with core services and shared resources and make your way out. Make the necessary operational changes to make this transition much smoother. And, and getting these right will make the transition and microservices a much better experience for the overall organization. Next, we talked about um, where to start and how to actually tie microservices back to the product and business value. 
Um, and then finally, we cover two key concepts in microservices and distributed systems around service to service communication and building for resiliency. I'm gonna pause on this slide for a little bit. Um, here are the reference links and additional resources for things that I've either referenced in this talk or materials that I found really helpful while doing research for this talk. So the first one is uh, the Ruby 2.7 upgrade process that I talked about um, because we're in this hybrid scenario and we needed to keep both um, the existing system uh, up to spec and also improving and iterating uh, in addition to starting the process of extracting microservices. Because chances are once you start down this microservices path, um, things are going to take a lot longer and be a lot more complicated as you uncover things um, than you originally anticipated. So do think about the timeline when you make the switch. Um, the second one is a reference to Scientist, which is the open source tool that I talked about for comparing old code path to new code path as we start making transitions between services. Um, TORP is the GRPC service to service communications framework that I mentioned um, earlier, and uh, that can be found at this link. And then uh, the rest are kind of just some of the things that I talked about around things to watch out for around uh, distributed computing when things are hosted uh, on different machines like network latency um, and how to design for failure, as well as some original microservices papers by Martin Feller, um, and also a really nice video that summarizes the right way of uh, designing for microservices. So, uh, so with that, um, I'm actually going to just open it up to questions, um, you know, and um, I, I'll take any questions from the audience. Awesome. Thank you, Shao, for, you know, taking time to share your level of experience, wealth of knowledge with us, and it's been amazing having you. Yeah, thank you for having me on this talk. Thank you.